what we mean by science. For me at least, and I think for most people, science and evidence are kind of inextricably linked to one another. So I'm going to talk about evidence. And in the same way as I um, chose a very simple uh, idea of an axiom in order to, uh, to describe what I mean by that, I'm going to have a very simple uh, example of the use of evidence. And the example I'm going to use, if you'll forgive me, uh, are our chairman's boxes, uh, by which I don't mean his dogs or his chain of prize fighters, but his boxer shorts. And I'm going to make, to begin with, an assumption that our chairman is wearing Union Jack boxer shorts. But it's not quite just an assumption, because this could be supported by evidence. I'm not going to ask him to reveal what kind of, he may not even have boxer shorts on at all. I'm not going to ask him what kind of boxer shorts he has on. But Clearly, that assumption is testable by evidence. In other words, it's not really an assertion at all. It's a hypothesis. It's a very trivial hypothesis, trivial in the sense that we could settle the matter once and for all by asking to see his boxer shorts. I'm not going to do so. But we could do. We could refute at a stroke my hypothesis, or we could confirm it, and that would be the end of the matter. But scientifically, this is trivial and not very useful to us, and really very, as you might imagine, in all sorts of ways, atypical of science in general. But it's atypical in a, in a particularly important way that I want to explain now. And I'll replace my first hypothesis with a more scientifically meaningful one. My more scientifically meaningful hypothesis is that our chairman always wears Union Jack boxer shorts. Now, we could make a start this evening in testing that hypothesis. If we saw his boxer shorts and they were not Union Jack boxer shorts, that hypothesis would be refuted at a stroke. If he was, that could do no more than increase my confidence somewhat that my hypothesis is correct. You'll remember that in my first speech, I said I would defend two basic contentions in tonight's debate. First, that there's no good reason to think that belief in God is false, which Professor Begin must show if he's to defend the view that it is an illusion or delusion. Unfortunately, we've yet to hear any arguments tonight to think that that belief is false, and so far we've not heard any grounds for thinking that belief in God is delusory. Now, what about my arguments to show that belief in God is not delusory, but is in fact a true belief? Here, I am surprised by how conciliatory uh, Dr. Begin is toward my arguments. Take the first one based on the origin of the universe. He accepts the first premise, he accepts the second premise. Therefore, it follows with logical necessity that the universe has a cause of its existence. Now, I wonder what Professor Begin thinks that cause is. If those two premises are true, there must be a transcendent cause beyond space and time, beyond the universe, which brought the universe into being. Who or what is this? Well, I argued that it must be, and I quote from my opening speech, a being which is timeless, spaceless, uncaused, immaterial and having unfathomable power. All of those follow from the properties of being beyond time and space. Moreover, I argued it had to be personal as well because the only thing that fits those descriptions are either abstract objects or a mind and abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. And I submit to you that given my experience of God as a living reality in my life, in the absence of some sort of defeater, like some arguments for atheism, which haven't been offered yet in the debate tonight, I see no reason to think that my experience is delusory, and therefore I'm perfectly within my rational rights to believe that God exists on the basis of my personal experience of God. So there is an argument here. The argument is that we can rationally accept belief in God as a properly basic belief grounded in one's experience of God in the absence of any defeater of that belief. So, in summary then, it seems to me that Dr. Begin's 
Epistemological evidentialism is naive, uh, it is overly restrictive, and in the end self-refuting. And in any case, I met his challenge by giving good evidence for God's existence. Five reasons to think that God exists. On the other side of the ledger, we've yet to hear any evidence to think that God does not exist. And therefore, I think we have good grounds for thinking that belief in God is not a delusion, but quite the contrary, that God exists. Um, and he says that I must show that a belief in God is false. I don't know why the onus has to be on me. I, I thought it was on him. But let's just consider that a moment in my last half minute here. It seems to me that a belief is false if it is held in the absence of evidence. There is no evidence for this belief. Therefore, a belief in God is false. Thank you. Before I look again at those two contentions that I said I'd defend tonight, let's uh, try to say something more about these matters of epistemology. Remember I argued that the dictionary definition of a delusion is a false belief or opinion. So Dr. Begin is offering us a revisionary definition uh, of what a delusion is. And he's saying that something is a delusion if it is neither self-evident nor held on the basis of evidence. And in his last speech, he made the astonishing assertion that a belief is false if it is held in the absence of evidence. Well, that is, that's patently wrong. It's easy to give counterexamples. Suppose I believe that there is a person standing right outside this door at this very moment. I have no evidence for that. Does that mean that belief is false? No, he could be there right now. In fact, when we make predictions about the future, we uh, don't know whether they'll come true or not, but if they do come true, then those were true predictions. So it's patently wrong that uh, a belief is false if it uh, is asserted in the absence of evidence. But I gave two criticisms of his evidentialism. First, that it's overly restrictive. Remember my example, how it would undermine science. The special theory of relativity is based upon certain assumptions about the one-way velocity of light that cannot be scientifically proven. Another example, the Copernican principle. This underlies all of modern astronomy. It states that we occupy no special place in the universe. Without the assumption of this principle, it's possible that the um, a dif a distant galaxies operate according to other laws of nature, and therefore all of our data about them is wrong. You simply have to assume the Copernican principle that the same laws operate there that operate here in order for astronomy and astrophysics to even poss be possible. So his evidentialism would destroy science if you adopted it. Moreover, it would mean our beliefs in the external world, the reality of the past, are not justified. He says, no, no, these are based on evidence. Well, this is just philosophically naive. I think he needs to take a good dose of reading in skeptical thinkers like Descartes and David Hume, who will show that all of my experience would be exactly the same if I were a body in the matrix. There's, there's nothing you can do scientifically by way of gathering experience to show that that's false. It is simply a properly basic belief that is grounded in our experience of the external world. But you can't uh, provide evidence for it because that assumes that the evidence we gather is veridical, which is what the hypothesis denies. Moreover, I pointed out that it's self-refuting the statement only believe in what is self-evident or uh, inferred by evidence is not itself self-evident. In fact, many, most philosophers today disagree with it. Neither is it based on evidence. It's an arbitrary definition and a bad one at that. Now, what's the cash value of this? It means that if you're to show that God is a delusion, you've got to show the belief to be false. That's what the definition of a delusion is. It's a false belief or opinion, and we've yet to hear any evidence tonight to show that it is false. <laughs>
We're going to begin. Thank you. Next question, please, for Professor Began. You say that beliefs held without evidence are irrational. Would that not make your own belief that God does not exist irrational, given that you have no evidence for it? Well, I do not believe, I do not hold the belief that God does not exist. That is an accusation that is often made against atheists. I believe that God is a delusion. I am here to defend the proposition or to propose the proposition that God is a delusion. A delusion to me is a belief held when there is no evidence to support that. I am not making the positive statement that God does not exist, and you should really not accuse me of saying that. To say that God is a delusion is very different from saying that God does not exist. As a scientist, I wouldn't make such a statement. Professor Craig. Those statements are only different if you adopt this non-standard definition of a delusion that he's offered us tonight. But according to the dictionary, a delusion is a false belief or opinion. So if the statement, God exists, is a delusion, that means that that is false. And if one asserts that that is false, then the questioner is quite right. This is an assertion to know something. It's a claim to knowledge, as opposed to agnosticism, which says God may or may not exist. But if you claim that God does not exist, you're making a knowledge claim, and that therefore requires warrant, particularly on evidentialism, as she rightly saw. The evidentialist would need to provide some sort of argument. And traditionally, atheists have tried to do this. The evil and suffering in the world, uh, can God make a stone heavier than he can lift? You've, you know all the arguments. Uh, but none of these, I think, are successful in supporting atheism, and so I don't think there are good grounds for uh, thinking that the evidentialist atheist can bear his share of the burden of proof.